Hello everyone, this is Rich Rogers and you are watching one of the game night, the pound game nights for Indie Plus. It is, uh, at least in my time zone, February 16th, 2013, and this is a panel with a number of game designers on small press and indie folks, and the name of the panel is, Is Fantasy Dead? Uh, we are going to talk about the, the preponderance of tabletop role-playing games that are focused around uh, the D&D and Pathfinder style of, of fantasy, and has everything been done before? It's been 40 plus years. Has it all been done before? That's the question we're going to tackle. I've got uh, five wonderful panelists, and I will introduce them now. Uh, I'm going to go from, uh, as I see, from the right hand to the left hand side of the, the smiling faces at the bottom of my screen. Uh, John Wick is the author of over 20 role-playing games, including Legend of the Five Rings, Seventh Sea, Houses of the Blooded, and The Aegis Project. He's feverishly finishing his work on Wicked Fantasy, which is a supplement for the Pathfinder RPG that completely reinvents the generic fantasy races. How are you doing, John? I'm doing very well, thanks. And over in Finland is James Raggi. James runs Lamentations of the Flame Princess, which is a Finland-based tabletop RPG publishing company specializing in horrific, weird, and old-school releases. LOTFP's releases include Weird Fantasy Role-Playing, Carcosa, and Vornheim, The Complete City Kit. How are you, James? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Good. Thanks for coming Thank on. Thank you for having me. Uh, we also have Jill Frazier, who has been working for a year with John Wick on Wicked Fantasy as the lead designer. Hello, Jill. Hi. Uh, David Hill is the he co-owns Machine Age Productions as well. He's a frequent freelance writer, editor, and developer for numerous publishers, including White Wolf, Catalyst, Posthuman, Green Ronin, and Margaret Weiss Productions. He's currently working on a fate-powered philosophical mecha game called Apotheosis Drive X. How are you doing, David? Good. I'm good. <laughs> I caught you wrong when you're drinking the beer. Sorry. <laughs> Just write a shorter intro so you can get that one in. Um, Brendan Taylor, good buddy of mine. Co he's the owner of Galileo Games, author of the sci-fi action game Bulldogs, the settingless but magic-themed Mortal Coil, and the Native American-inspired fantasy game How We Came to Live Here. He's also the author of the fantasy heartbreaker The Legend of Yore. Not so sadly out of print. How are you doing, <laughs> Brennan? Good. Good. Thanks, everyone, for uh, for coming on as we tackle the... Uh, I, I guess this would be possibly the, uh, the autopsy of fantasy. I mean, we've got 40-plus years. We've done all that there is to do in fantasy, right? No. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. no. Good answer, no. <laughs> All right. So I am going to start with Josh Roby's question. I crowdsourced a number of questions here. And Josh Roby, who's a game designer of his own right, but he doesn't write fantasy stuff, so he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not on here. Uh, I'm going to start with Brennan. Brennan, what is fantasy? What is fantasy? Uh, I don't think the elves and orcs and you know, Tolkien stuff that we talk about with D&D &D is the only thing that's fantasy, which is why my answer was no. <laughs> I mean, I did uh, How We Came to Live Here, which I consider a fantasy, and it's based on Native American mythology. So I think a fantasy is anything where there is uh, magic, where there is uh, exploration of themes through the fantastic, basically. Human themes. Uh, David, the question to you. What is fantasy to you? Um, well, uh, to define it, because we have to, because that's the question, um, <laughs> I, I kind of look at it as the sort of the, the opposite of sci-fi. Um, I see sci-fi as um, stories where the addition of technology um, determines the, the scope and the sort of twists of the story. Um, if you don't have uh, an increase and in change in technology um, that actually influences your story, it's not sci-fi to me. So fantasy is sort of the opposite of that. Um, you you sort of have the um, the addition of non-realism, uh, mythology, magic, um, or even just a lack of technology, um, and that is that is the uh, focus of the story. If you remove that element, it ceases to be fantasy for me. Uh, Jill, to you, um, what is fantasy to you? 
Fantasy is anything that's not real to me. So fantasy can't be dead because fantasy is in your imagination, so you can't run out of imagination. So fantasy is anything <laughs> not real. <laughs> uh, well, James, what about you? What, what is fantasy to you? Uh, basically, anything make-believe that couldn't happen in real life. Wow, that is a wide open variety. <laughs> well, yeah, that, yeah, it is. <laughs> Great. Uh, John? I don't think fantasy is a genre. Um, much like I don't think steampunk is a genre. Uh, steampunk is a style. It, it's a fashion, but it's not a genre. Uh, because if if uh, if Harry Potter and and Frodo can both be called fantasy, then that's not a genre. Because genre is much more tight. You know, you can say that noir is a genre because it has certain key elements to it. But you can have fantasy novels that, for example, don't have magic. So, you know, it's, it's very... Uh, I don't think fantasy is a genre and therefore can't really be categorized in that way. Okay, fair, fair. Um, so Ro Josh Roby also asked another question that I, I think is... Who let Josh Roby in here? Well, I, I want to get him out of the way. I, I like the guy. <laughs> so we'll just kind of get him at the front, and we'll front load him, and then we can put him aside. Uh, I'm joking. Josh is awesome. Uh, what's the intrinsic benefit of fantasy? I'll stay with you, John. What's the intrinsic benefit of fantasy? In other words, why choose to write in that genre, non-genre, in that oeuvre, whatever you want to define it as? What does it provide that, that other types of gaming don't? It provides you with the ability to start your story with Once Upon a Time, uh, which puts things in a distant place so you can talk about them safely. Um, that's what that's what fairy tales and and mythology is for, is to tackle really difficult questions about you know people about you know about ethics and morals and things like that, but you put it way over there so it's less dangerous. It's not as close, and in that way you can you can address really difficult choices, real difficult things like you know good and evil and life and death and and all that kind of stuff. And that's what fantasy is for. Otherwise, it's just power wish fulfillment, and that's pornography, and I'm not interested in writing pornography. Uh, James, to you, what's, what's the benefit of writing in fantasy? Uh, it's basically the ability to just do anything. You know, What if you had a story about somebody that could you know, create life forms out of water, just like that, or can control people with their mind, or, or you know, just anything that you can think of, if it's fantasy, you can just put in and play with it and see what happens, see how other people react to it, and you don't have to worry that it's wrong. You, you don't, you, you know, if you're doing something that's real world based or, you know, hard sci-fi, you have to know the science, you have to know the history, but as soon as you call it fantasy, you can concentrate on the fun things and just kind of hand wave the, uh, the real things. Joe, what are some of the things as you've been working on uh, this, this production, what are some of the things about fantasy that you've enjoyed? Uh, part of the fantasy that I really enjoy, especially with what I work on with the Pathfinder aspects of it, which are elves and gnomes and all of that, is the aspect of fantasy is all about heroes, really big heroes, and it's fun to be a hero. So everything should be about being one and doing the right thing and doing all that, and that's a big part of the fantasy that's out there. So for me, it's a lot of hero is the be-all, end-all, and everyone is here to be a hero. David, to you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> no, cor no worries. Um, yeah, so I, um, I uh, Josh, um, I love the guy. I'm going to play a game of his tomorrow, but um, that's a loaded question. That's, that's bullshit. Um, the, I don't think that there inherently has to be a, an intrinsic benefit of it. Um, I, I know, um, you know John and Jim have stated stuff here. Um, I, I don't know that there is necessarily an intrinsic benefit um, that you can't get elsewhere. Um, you're, 
we're talking about, Jim was saying, you know, it's, it's a way that you can deal with something without having to worry about the science and worrying about the knowing the, the specifics and you just get to the fun part. Um, and that can be nice, um, but then again, it's also a crutch um, for a lot of people who are kind of writing, writing things that are trash, effectively. I, you, get a, you get a lot of, like, the old pulp. Um, some of it was good, a lot of it was not, and it was all, oftentimes because of these crutches. If you don't have to adhere to some sense and some semblance of a reality, you can just throw whatever shit at the wall you want and look at what sticks. And fortunately, we had a lot of um, authors from that period that stuck. You know, we had our Chandlers and stuff, but um, there was a lot that also fell. Um, if you want to be a total ignoramus about the way that the world works, um, that's a good place to do it. Um, if you want to ignore the way that social structures work, the way that science works, that's an awesome way to do it. Um, or you can just sort of stick with the way that things works and try to appeal, appeal to sensibilities and think about what you're doing. Um, that's, I, I don't really think there is a value in fantasy. Very interesting. Um, well, Brennan, uh, let's let's see what you have to add here. What is there an intrinsic <laughs> benefit to fantasy? <laughs> I, I, I don't know that uh, there is. You know that that it lacks uh, a value. I, I mean, I know David was just saying that uh, <laughs> there isn't any value to it. I, I don't know that it, that's actually what he was saying. But uh, it, it, I think it is useful for telling certain kinds of stories and. When you get into it in a game design context, it becomes useful in a way of making people allowed to deal with certain issues without having to have it bleed over into real life, like John was saying. Um, I know when I was talking to Jason Morningstar recently, he was, he, you know, his his latest game, Durance, is set on an alien planet, which is a fantastic element. And he did that because he wanted to make a game about Australia, but nobody would buy a game about Australia. <laughs> they will buy a game about a, a space uh, penal colony. So, <laughs> you know, I think there's some value in it for that reason. Uh, it allows people a little bit of distance from, from real life stuff, you know, that it lets you uh, deal with real issues in a way that is non-threatening. And that is, uh, I guess... Um, it also lets you imagine things out to the to a conclusion that you can't reach in real life, right? That uh, yeah, go ahead, John. You have I think Dogs there. in the Vineyard is a really good role playing game for illustrating that point. In that Vincent, it was Vincent Baker, right? Yeah. yeah. John Swispery, I'm sorry, Vincent. I love your game. Um, but Vincent used Dogs in the Vineyard to illustrate to his family why you know what he saw. Mormonism as, right? Without invoking Mormons at all. And he put it in a place that was not our place. He put it in a time that was not our time, but it was familiar enough. Um, and, you know, and it talked about real questions about good and evil and about law and about, you know, all those things and about religion and faith. And it's a very powerful game that is a fantasy, but still addresses real problems in a very I don't want you know safe is, is almost a is almost a loaded word but it does address all those problems in a very real way but also in a very safe way and that's I think that's a dogs is a really good example of that David did you have something yeah but um, are we really talking about fantasy there or is that just um, sorry that's my son just one second um, are we talking about fantasy there or is that just allegory I mean if we want to say that fantasy, fantasy is fantasy allegory is yeah if we want to say that all allegory is fantasy that's cool um, but that's just I don't really see it that way because that's totally something that could happen there's only this like thin patina of non-reality. Like, basically, um, Vincent took the, the names of things, filed some serial numbers off. It's totally realistic stories. There's, there's no real fantasy elements there. There's nothing there that happens that could not happen in the real world at all. Well, certainly there is. It's not, it's not here. It's elsewhere. It's a fairy tale. That's the whole point. It's like I said, I don't think fantasy is a genre at all. It's trappings. 
Um, yeah, I you know, can see that. Elves, dwarves, and everything. They're just trappings. You know, and, and everything else is, you know, you could, you know, other points are things like, you know, frankly, I, I am not enamored of Tolkien. I'm not the biggest Tolkien fan. Um, but I am a huge fan of Stephen Donaldson. And his Thomas Covenant stuff is raw, powerful, emotional, and dealing with real emotional problems in an allegory in a fantasy world that has magic and it has demons and it has all those things. And it's made more poignant by the fact that someone from our world is in it. And that's why it's useful, because you have both of those levels. You have the allegorical level and you have the literal level of the protagonist who probably isn't a protagonist, but is still interacting with that world in a very real way. And you can't tell that story with just him walking down the street. You can't tell that kind of story. Okay. So I don't know if anybody's read the Thomas Covenant stories, but there you go. Definitely, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I heard a lot of good stuff, but no, I have not read that. They're uh, hard. They're not. <laughs> I, I've had people read up to Chapter 5 and throw the book. So they're tough books. Yeah, I, I tried reading that the first one when I was a uh, real little kid, and I just wasn't ready for it. But I haven't come back to it as an adult. It's it's serious stuff. It's not power yeah. wish fulfillment fantasy, that's for sure. Yeah. Um. So to start with the next question, this was sent by Ralph Mazza, and I want to start with you, James. <laughs> I want to start with you, James. Um. To okay. what to what extent? Is the current reinterest in previous editions of Dungeons and Dragons and the resurgence of uh, old school priorities, the result of thirty and forty something gamers in their peak spending years remembering nostalgically the games of their youth? Uh well, obviously some of that is important. The nostalgia is important to that, and I think the you know when you're diving back, if you haven't played the game for twenty, thirty years, then yeah, you're remembering what it was when you were young but I know for me because that's the realm of design and publishing I deal with uh, you know when I first got into the game when I was what eight nine years old my game sucked we were little kids and had no idea what we were doing so you know I'm almost 40 now and I don't want a game when I was like the way I was when I was 10 or 15 or 20 so the idea is not specifically to go back and game like it's 1985, but you know those old games they they were good for things they they are not broken at all and I think uh, a lot of the old school Renaissance because that's what we're talking about here it's really about rediscovering first rediscovering the old games and realizing they're not like some old piece of technology that's obsolete and doesn't work anymore and then building on that I think there's been way too much new stuff and original stuff to just say oh nostalgia and dismiss it that way uh, Brennan uh, what, do, do you have an, any alternative viewpoints as to the, the power of the what we call fantasy gaming being the D&D &D, the pathfinders of the world just the fact that uh, the the majority of the demographic are the the old gamers that just want this the same type of game. Um, I'm not sure that I would say that the majority of the demographic is, you know, is after this you know this nostalgia. I don't think that's the only reason that they're into it. I mean, I agree with James. I think there's a lot more stuff going on there, especially in the OSR. Um, you've got all kinds of different takes on this going back to different levels uh, in, in the history. And I think there's, you know, there, there's a certain nostalgia element, but I also think there's an awful lot of creativity going on in that, in that community. And uh, I, I just, I don't think you can just dismiss it as a, as a only purely a nostalgic exercise. Uh, David, do you have a viewpoint on this one? Um, I, I actually don't. Um, those type of games really have never been my thing. Um, I didn't really get started with those type of games. Um, I've never really been interested in them. A few times I've tried to like sort of poke at that crowd a little bit and try to find out what makes them tick and design for them, but I've never really gotten any answers that I feel that I, um, I am interested in designing for, so just not for me. 
Cool. Uh, Jill, now that you're you're designing for a Pathfinder game, right? Pathfinder supplement. Uh, what's your what's your feel on on this type of question? Uh, the nostalgia factor. I don't think it's all nostalgia. I think a lot of it is people are unhappy with what came out recently in the Dungeons and Dragons world and very other similar games. The reason Pathfinder did so well is because fourth edition was not fun in the long run. A fourth edition is the first game I played. I have a special place in my heart for it because it's what introduced me to role playing games. But I like Pathfinder better because it's there's more to do in the game, I guess. I don't know how to best explain it. It's just I, I like it better. And a lot of it is because people are unhappy with what came out for people who play those type of games. They were really unhappy with uh, Wizards of the Coast coming out with 4th edition. It wasn't what they were promised. And next just kind of feels like a rehashing of Pathfinder from everything that I've seen. So I think a lot of it is not a people are nostalgic. I think they're just unhappy, so they're going back to what they had fun with. John. Yep. Uh, sorry, uh, revisiting the same question there about the nostalgia. <laughs> Anything uh, do you have to I offer? I don't think it is nostalgia. Um, I think that because the guys who design Dungeon World are not my age. I mean, I am that target audience if we're talking about nostalgia. Um, and, you know, I, I don't feel any nostalgia to do that, but then again, I've never been a big D&D fan to begin with. So, But the guys who designed it aren't that age, and they weren't aren't that age, and they're not necessarily, you know, nostalgic. Um, but, you know, when everyone starts... What's really interesting to me is that when everybody starts saying that Dungeon World should be D&D 5th Edition, that... That says a lot to me, and it and it has. I don't think it has as much to do with nostalgia as what Jill said, in that people were just incredibly disappointed with Fourth Edition, and mm -hmm. because of that, you've had a response of people going, "Okay, going forward was bad. Let's go back, and you know, and go back to what D and D used to be, not out of a sense of nostalgia, but in a sense that D and D Fourth Edition was a misstep." So. Okay, great. Uh, so we're going to stay with another question from Ralph Mazza, and I want to start with you, David. Uh, so put put on your your tinfoil hat and magically transport yourself thirty to forty years into the future. What are those gamers going to look back with fondness to now and try to resurrect? What are, what are they going to try to remember and bring back? That's a really, really difficult question. Um, if we're talking about, um, if we're talking about, well, Ralph's question, um, the consumers of 20 years from now, um, the 30 and 40 year old crowd, um, okay. we're talking about, yeah, we're talking about people who are like between 10 and 20 right now. Um, if I had any idea what kind of games that they wanted to be playing, um, I would not be a small press publisher. Uh, so, so that's a um, that's a hurdle that we've yet to get to. I mean, a lot of people who are um, a lot of people who are purchasing games right now um, are a slightly older demographic. Um, not even necessarily like you know the forty plus demographic, but we've got a lot of people who are uh, uh, you know in their late twenties and their in their thirties uh, who have been in this for a while. Um, it is kind of difficult to stretch out into those younger audiences um, and predict what they're going to be interested in. Um, we haven't seen a real big thing. Uh, we've seen a few sort of bumps of big things. We've seen our dungeon worlds um, right now, like Fate Cores pretty big, and it looks like it's not getting any smaller. Um, that might be something that the younger crowd gets picked up on. I, I would I would love it if Fate Accelerated is the thing that people are talking about getting into the hobby with uh, 20 years from now. That's um, if, if I had to predict something, I would say that sort of thing is probably what people are going to be remembering and rehashing. That's going to be the nostalgia game in 20 years. Uh, James, to you, uh, and let me restate, thank you, David, for correcting me. I got all excited about my, my example of future travel and screwed up the question. So, Ralph, I apologize, but what games and play styles do you think the 30 and 40-something-year-old game consumers of 20 years from now are going to remember and want to re resurrect? James, what do you think? Uh, yeah, um, I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> well... Well, honestly, uh, my uh, my exposure to gamers here in Finland, uh, because I 
never really picked up the Finnish language that well, it's not easy for me to just join other people's games. So the games I'm involved with are the games that I run or you know, ones that other foreigners run or things that are supposed to be friendly to foreigners. So the past five years, the role-playing games I've actually played have been very few, and everybody that's in that, you know, teens or early 20s demographic, they've either been in my games or they've been at convention games, which are running, you know, roughly the same sort of games that that I do. So I, I have no idea. It's not like... Uh, you know, it's not like any of my sales channels give demographics or information at all. So I have no idea who's buying my stuff. I have no idea who's playing my stuff. And I just know the people that I directly play with, how old they are and what they like. So it's 20, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who the market is now, let alone in 20 years. I just do what I do and hope somebody likes it. Jill, I, I think you might actually have the highest chance of still being alive 20 years from now of uh, this group. Uh, so why don't you offer your opinion? Well, I am currently 23. So we are talking roughly about where I'm going to be 20 years from now and what am I going to play nostalgically. Um, I'm not really sure. Right now I like Pathfinder. I don't know what I'm going to like five years from now. I enjoy narrative control, and I kind of hope that 20, 30 years from now, that's what's going to be remembered. Being able to add to the story with the narrator, the game master, or whatever you're calling it, whatever game you're playing. Okay. Uh, Brennan? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm with James. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is a terrible question. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Thanks, Ralph Misa. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Ralph. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't have predicted the OSR 20 years ago. I mean, come on. It, it's, it's, it, it's, it's just uh, us purely speculating. I don't think there's any good answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you this, this question, kind of off the cuff here. But it, it seems like we had a, a long... And, of course, you can dispute that there have always been lots of RPGs out there, right? But there has been, in the last 10 years, an explosion of new tabletop RPGs. I, I, don't, I think that's pretty apparent to anybody that is going to a gaming store or going to Gen Con. They're going to see lots of things, lots of options. And it almost feels as if there's a cult of the new. I mean, Dungeon World is the hot thing now, Two years from now, will anybody even be talking about Dungeon World? Will we have a nostalgia point, or have we hit this point to where everything is so fractious and there are so many different options out there that there is no groundswell that can ever overtake the large brands? Hmm. Uh, well, considering how well Fate's done and you know the surge of popularity, uh, I don't think you can say that nothing new is ever going to get really popular. I mean, I don't think that uh, you know, Evil Hat is up at Paizo popularity levels, but I think they're on their way. So I think it is possible for a new idea to take hold and get really popular to where it's a major player in the industry. So yeah, that's certainly possible. It all depends on how the people handle it. Um, for a long time, Steve Jackson Games GURPS was huge. You know, it was it was a big seller. And it's not anymore because they made some missteps. They they didn't understand the reason people buy GURPS games. And I got a whole shelf. I got a whole shelf of GURPS source books. Um, the reason that people bought GURPS was for source books. You know, whether or not they were playing the game is difficult to tell, but they were sure buying the source books. People who don't play GURPS bought the source books. And so they stopped making source books with 4th edition and just started making new rules. And people stopped buying GURPS. You know, that says a lot. It, it, um, I don't know how many people consider the New World of Darkness a failure, but it certainly wasn't a, a, a success. It wasn't the success they wanted. And that's, again, that's a misstep. You know, 
Uh, game companies can make missteps, and when they do, it's it's hard to recover from them because people consider the, the general gaming public looks at a game and goes, "Well, this is a dead game." You know, off to the used bookstore you go. You know, um, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, so it it has a lot more to do with what you know what fate is going to do next and what Dungeon World is going to do next that will determine whether we're talking about it in five years or not. Uh, David, any opinion, sir? Well, I think that um, now we're talking about fate, um, but people were kind of talking about it five years ago. Um, that's the reason why they're talking about it now. So there's that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, I... I think that the, really the reason why a lot of people are are looking to the um, D and D as a point of nostalgia, they're looking back at that, isn't necessarily because of a like a fractious industry or anything like that. It's it's more that that was the first thing, and that's the first thing that a lot of them were exposed to. Still to this day, um, you walk into a game store and there are going to be people playing D and D, um, and that's the thing that everyone heard about because of you know the Satanic Panic and all of that bullshit. Um, so when people think about role playing games, when I, I've seen designers um, who like when I'm when I'm at a convention and I'm talking to other designers, um, and somebody will come up to us in the line at Subway and be like, "Oh, what is it you guys are doing here?" And they're like, "Well, we we design games." And they're like, "Well, like Monopoly? No, like like Dungeons and Dragons." And then they try to explain it and they try to do it by relating it to that. That's the reason why we get the nostalgia. Um, that's the reason why people are looking back to it. it has, I don't really think it has a lot to do with it. Um, the, the popularity inherently. I, um, I don't think it matters how many play, people are even playing D&D anymore. It's always going to be a sort of basis of comparison. It's always going to be a relation point because it was publicly known. Um, maybe we won't have another point like that. I don't, I don't really care. It's not an important issue to me. So I don't have a strong opinion on that. Brendan, anything to add? Well, I don't know that I find the the variety of games to be something that I would consider a problem. Basically, uh, there's so many different games out right now that no matter what you're interested in, you can find something that's gonna that's gonna excite you. And so, you know, where's the problem? Basically, <laughs> yeah, more games is good. More games is good. Yeah, I I I, I do think that that's. That's not a, not going to be an issue, and the fact that there's no big blockbuster success doesn't hurt anybody, you know, apart from maybe people who want to make a lot of money, but uh, why are they game designers? So. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it, it's, like, it's like this. Brennan has a really great game about magic. Yeah. Right? yeah. He has a really great game about magic. In the back of my head, I have a game about magic that one day I will write, um, but if I publish a game about magic and there's Brennan's game about magic... What's going to happen is that the fans aren't going to pick between them. They're going to get both of them. That's the way gamers are, because they want more information. That I will read John's game about magic. I'll read Brennan's game about magic. I will take stuff from both of them, probably make my own you know, type thing, or they will steal stuff from mine to use in Brennan's. That's how gamers are. And so more is good. That's I don't see it as being fractured at all. That's a... That's a marketing term by marketing men who don't understand how the game industry works. Right. I'd just like to point out I'm not a marketing person. <laughs> Was it? Got a eye on you. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I want to kind of skip ahead. We're starting to, to move along in time. Mark D.S. Truman uh, sent this question through the Indie Plus page uh, live while we were talking. Who let What's that the, guy in here? What? Oh, no. We don't want to hear what Mark has to say. <laughs> Joking. Mark is a big part of Indie Plus, so I kicked him out of this panel, so I could have you guys to myself. <laughs> All right, uh, what is the toughest part of fantasy to write as a style or genre? What uh, part trips you up as a designer or writer? Uh, I want to I start with you, Jill. Uh, talk about what's been the toughest part for you. A lot of what we do, especially with Wicked Fantasy, is finding an element of the race that we were working on and turning it to eleven. So a lot of what trips me up is trying to write something for somebody else. I know how I would write it, so it would be fun for me, but I'm not going to play a dwarf. So I need to write it for someone who wants to play a dwarf. So one of the hardest parts I find is 
writing and designing something for someone else to have fun playing it. So I know with dwarves, I struggled for months before I got anything down on paper that somebody else would have fun playing. And it turned out to be a handful of D20s, but you do what you can to make people happy. <laughs> Why were dwarves so hard? Because they were a male race, and I am not very masculine. <laughs> James, uh, uh, to you, what's the toughest part? of? Uh... Uh, the toughest part is taking that great, fantastic idea and then grounding it so that it makes sense. It's able to be communicated to other people, and it's something that can be uh, put into as many people's games as possible. It's very easy to just come up with this wow, wild idea and have it just hang out there in space, but if people aren't going to use it, it's kind of a pointless exercise. So it, it's got to be developed so that not only does it stay true to this wow, great idea, but you know, people that don't have that same grade that you know think that this might just be just another tool have to be able to fit it into their game. So that's the tough part and then if you're you know and then when you get to the actual people part of it uh yeah i'm not one for great characterization but it's got to at least seem believable if not realistic when you start you know having normal people of the setting involved and in being described and that's always a tough part for me because the well how you know, relating to the average normal person is not why I'm in this game. So, you know, that's always tough for me. It's easy to make screwed up people or the noteworthy people, but, you know, all of that just seems really superficial if there's nothing about what happens to the everyday person in this world. So. All right. Uh, Brennan, I want to post this one to you. What trips you up as a designer or writer? for fantasy um, genre? There's a couple of things that can be difficult. One is, uh, decide, I mean, fantasy is so huge. It's, it, it encompasses so much. It's sort of deciding what you want to actually include, what gets put to the side, because there's you, you have to make some decisions about what you actually want to include in any uh, particular fantasy setting. And the possibilities, of course, are endless. So narrowing that down can be difficult. Um, and one of the other things that I, I I enjoy it, but it can be difficult to uh, you know you you can make missteps. I think you can you can do stuff that that strains credulity if you include fantastic elements but don't think through the consequences very well. Basically, uh, things that you you've included, but then your uh, your setting starts to uh, starts to break down logically. <laughs> Well, lo logic? Should you apply logic? Should I we apply logic should. to fantasy? I, I it's think magic. you have to. I think you have to because people are going to be playing. You know, human beings are going to yeah. be playing this. And if they if they go in and it's it's like completely wacky and everything goes and it doesn't make any sense, then they're going to be you know they they don't have any any footing. They don't have anything to grab hold of to uh, to be able to understand it and to relate to it. So. Or they'll create their own logic because if you, uh, I mean, if you put in something that's got completely unintended consequences, uh, the players are going to uh, find something to do with that. And if you're playing, you know, three, four, twenty, a hundred sessions, you know, that great idea that you had for the second adventure can still be haunting your game by the hundredth as they're like, well, we use this zappy thing again in this way that you hate. And, uh, so, yeah, yeah, that logic and, and thinking through the consequences of what you're including, that's a big thing. David, uh, to kind of get back to the question about the toughest part of fantasy to write, uh, I know you just recently concluded a, a Kickstarter, which was kind of postmodern fantasy, and you've got some Pathfinder supplements that you're looking for people to help write. Uh, what, what, what trips you up? Um, what trips me up is um, you going back to the the sort of the allegory and the crutch that I was talking about earlier. Uh, just asking asking what does this mean? Uh, what what implications does this have? Um, and why are we doing it? There's um there's a there's a sales trick that I use and it sort of works in reverse with writing fantasy. Um, and the the thing is 
whenever you're going to include a fantasy element, you ask yourself why. Um, you ask yourself why, and then whatever answer you come up with, you ask why again. And then you ask why one more time. Um, by the time you get to the third why, you should have a really good idea of why you're doing something. And if you don't have a very good idea or you're not comfortable with the idea, you should probably cut the thing. Like um, we, we were talking about in, in Farewell to Fear, our fantasy game, uh, we were talking about possibility of things like orcs. And we asked ourselves, why, why are orcs villains? Why are orcs a problem in games? Well, because they are evil and attack people. Well, does that actually happen? Is that something that really happens uh, between different, different races of, of, of creatures? Why is this? Well, because they're kind of dumb, they're easy to lead, they're big and burly. Okay, so that's, that's a problem. Um, why don't we deal with them in a different way? Well, because they can't, re because they don't really fit in with the way that we do things, and they don't fit in with um, with our social strata. Um, they they don't follow the same rules that we do. Uh, they don't, they don't even look like us. Well, why why is that an issue? Why is that a problem for you? Well, I don't really have a good answer for that that I am comfortable with. So cut it. No works. Didn't fucking bother with them. I didn't think they were an issue. Um, so that's my biggest hurdle, Mark, is that I need to know why the hell I'm doing something. Good. Interesting. Um, I just got another live question. This... Hold on, I want to answer. Oh, oh okay, John. <laughs> Sorry. This is what I get for bouncing around. When I went this way and across, I never missed anybody. I got all fancy with myself and screwed up. Sorry. So, John, please. Um... I like what I, I like what David said about about orcs because I love orcs because they represent to me all the problems that generic fantasy has exactly what David said that all the problems that generic fantasy has so in orc world I I addressed all those problems why are orcs cannibalistic why are they you know why why are they you know and it turns out that I I turned all of the things that are evil about orcs into racial traits that make perfect sense if you look at them from an orc point of view. Um, the orcs in Wicked Fantasy that Jill and I just finished um, are an evil race that was created by evil gods to make evil. It's just that simple. They're made big, brutish, and dumb to follow orders, because that's what the evil gods wanted. And, uh, and they told the orcs, go and eat your enemies, because if you eat your enemies, you take their strength. And the orcs said, well, this, this, is, this makes sense, but what makes more sense is if we eat the gods, then we'll be even stronger. So the orcs went and ate their gods and became strong. But then because they killed the gods, they gained free will, and now they don't have to be evil. And that presents to an orc player that thing that Jill was talking about, which was what do orc players want to play? Uh, someone who plays an orc wants to be big, strong, powerful, and have that lingering voice of evil in the back of their head while they're trying to be good, trying to fight their orc nature while exploring what that orc nature is. So, you know, for me as an orc fan, that's a lot of fun. But, you know, I mean, and so that's what we did. We built that into that and then made mechanics that encouraged players to act that way. And that's the big thing. It, being an orc doesn't just mean you get a plus two to strength. It means that there are mechanics that make you play an orc differently than you would play a dwarf or play a halfling or anything else. Um, because, like my buddy Jared says, game design is mind control. That's the big thing. That's the trip up for me, is how to include mechanics that encourage different kinds of play based on what players want. So... There's that. Thanks, John. And I like orcs, too. Um, <laughs> Who doesn't like orcs? Jill, I got you for this one, right? I'm making sure I got everybody, because I'm about yeah, to move yeah, on. Right. Now I'm all, I'm all gun-shy. Uh, so from, <laughs> from the live feed of under the Google Plus page for Indie Plus, Daniel uh, De Santa Ana, who says, Greetings from Brazil to all of you. Uh, I'll start with you, James. I know we're going to pick on you again. But okay. uh, what's your opinion about all the OSR games? Old school resolution, revolution. Oh, they all suck. Oh, are there too many? <laughs> Why not play the old ones that inspired the retro clones? 
Okay, uh, first off, no, there are not too many. Uh, there will not be too many until people are making them when they don't really want to. If they're making one just to be part of the group, if they're making their own game just because they think they can sell a few copies, then there are too many. But everyone that wants to make one, everyone that thinks, that really thinks that their version is going to be the best, should make it. Period. I mean, that, that's, that's the fun. Um, who cares if anyone else thinks it's good? If you think you'll get something from it, from making it, do it. Put it out there. Free PDF, charge POD, whatever the hell you want to do. You know, that if it makes you excited creating it, create it. And as long as people are doing it for that reason, there are not too many. Uh, as far as why play one of the OSR games and instead of the original, uh, well... No reason if you don't find a reason. I mean, the originals are now all back in PDF, uh, and then you've got the, you know, very faithful clones. You've got the ones that do a little bit different. Uh, most, if not all, are available for download as free PDFs, so you can, you know, see which one tickles your fancy the most. If you like this iteration more than that iteration, then, you know, go for that one. And if you want... Yeah, it's... Yeah, I don't see it as an either-or kind of thing. Uh, you know, it's all out there. It's all roughly uh, more or less intercompatible. And, you know, collect them all. <laughs> well, uh, Brennan, I have to sure. pick on, on you. As the person who made Legend of Yore, would you agree that there are too many out there? <laughs> <laughs> I think mine was one too many, that's for sure. <laughs> mine wasn't even a retro clone, really. Uh but uh, I think, you know, one of the things is I think everybody's got a, a fantasy heartbreaker in them. So <laughs> just just don't try and print out, you know, a thousand copies of it and sell it. <laughs> or 10,000 copies. Or 10,000 copies. <laughs> Feel free to write one, but uh, be, be aware that, uh, you know, you may not be able to sell it just because you think it's great. But there's plenty of options. You can give things away for free on the Internet as a PDF. Yeah. Your people will pick it up. Um, and I'm, I'm with I'm with James. I don't think there's there's too many if people still want to to be exploring those things. There's there's uh, so many different aspects of the uh, of the OSR that people are you know of, of the retro play that people are exploring with these. There each one is taking up a different sort of uh, facet of it and 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 exploring that. Dungeon World does stuff that's completely different than Lamentations, so, you know, why not have both of them? Yeah, and uh, I just want to say, while it may not be a good idea to print up a thousand copies and try to sell them, it also might be a marvelous idea. Uh, <laughs> well, well, some of these are selling pretty well. Uh, you know, my... Uh, my sales figures are well into the four digits. Uh, I don't think Labyrinth Lord and Swords and Wizardry are, you know, doing too bad. So, you know, there is a market out there. Whether any particular game is going to hit that market, I don't know. But it's not automatically a stupid idea to decide you're going to print up a thousand copies and sell them. I mean, you don't know yeah. until they're all sitting in your garage or not. <laughs> right. But I would definitely say... Uh... Start small. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Work your way up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Go to Lulu. <laughs> right. <laughs> or Lightning Source. True. Yeah. True, true. Uh, David, Jill, uh, either you have uh, an opinion on uh, retro clones you want to share? Uh, no, <laughs> not really. I don't have any opinion on them. Cool. David? Anything? Yeah, I don't really care. I mean, people having fun. People like making games. If they're having fun making games, then fucking awesome for them. Cool. Cool. I think the question was, why not play the old ones? Yeah. I have an answer for that. They sucked. <laughs> I have my very first copy of Call of Cthulhu. I bought this. This is my, this is my very first role-playing game. It has no healing mechanics. It has one picture in the main rule book. The rules are confusing and hard to read. Um, the sanity mechanics are broken. I love this game. I love it dearly. But you know what? This version of Call of Cthulhu is better. 
It's got more pictures. It's got better mechanics. It's got better sanity mechanics. It's got a great Game Master chapter. It's just better. And it's cheaper than I bought the first one. <laughs> <laughs> so, this sucks. This is awesome. <laughs> you read First Edition Traveler. Go and read First Edition Traveler. I got it. It sucks. <laughs> Well, in that in that in that vein, um, yeah, I, I do have to say, uh, Osric, which is you know designed to be a restatement of first edition AD and D, is organized much better. Uh, you know, that's one reason to use you know a clone rather than the original. It doesn't have all the arcane language and all the weird stuff. I mean, if you haven't read the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide. You need to. I mean, that thing is just so wild and crazy, and every page has got a, whoa, that's cool. So organization isn't everything, but as far as the nuts and bolts playing the game, you know, I can't imagine if I was going to do first edition D&D that I would use the original player's handbook. I would use the Osric book because it's so much clearer, laid out better. You know, it's got that, uh, you know, 30 years of hindsight of how to present the game going for it. So there there are practical reasons for even the more faithful clones to use the new text rather than the original text. You know, people say that um, Dungeon World is an old school game. It's not. It's a new school game using old school trappings. Uh, there is a lot of new technology in that book. And uh, it is, yes, it's a dungeon hack, but it's not. I mean, if, if people in well, I, I'd, I'd be happier if 1977 Dungeon World was released instead of D&D. But, you know, that it's not, it's not new old technology. It's, it's not a retro game. It's a new game. So, anyway, that's what I'd say about that. Nice. Great. Uh, uh, that's a great answer, uh, James John. I appreciate it, guys. Uh, so this question is from uh, Dane Liebarger. I think it's a really good one, and it kind of changes our direction a little bit as we come near the end of this. Maybe give some people some, some reading material to think about. Uh, most fantasy RPGs and fantasy fiction has its ancestry in either pulp, sword and sorcery, Tolkien, or urban fantasy that brings magic and the weird into the modern day. When will we see a completely different take on the fantasy, on, on fantasy gain pop popularity? What would it take? John. Pure dumb luck. Oh. <laughs> dumb luck. <yeah. laughs> um, I I think we've been seeing some really neat things in fantasy literature. Uh, Joe Abercrombie's books are really different. They 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 do not feel like like standard fantasy stuff. Um, I was just oh, and it's slipping my mind. Uh, Jessica gave me a book to read that is a, a fantasy novel about a war, because I'm doing the war thing, video thing, and um, it is not Tolkien, it is not Michael Moorcock, it's not Robert E. Howard, um, and and uh, uh, you know, th there's a lot of fantasy out there, and uh, what's her name uh, that's writing the Kushal's Dart stuff, the softcore porn <laughs> fantasy novels. <laughs> that women keep handing to me. Um, I, I think it's I think it's fantastic what she's doing, and she's she's stretching out what fantasy means, in in very you know and what people are comfortable with, you know in in and stretching what people are comfortable with. That's the point of literature is to make is to push people to the point of being uncomfortable. You know, fantasy role playing games are most most of them are designed as comfort food. And there's, you know, hey, I like comfort food too, um, but you're not, they're not going to be as popular. Fantasy games that that do stretch what people stretch people's comfort zones are never going to be as popular as the ones that make people feel comfortable. How I came to live here is my worst selling game. And it's a great game. <laughs> oh yeah. But it is a it, great game, Brennan. It, it's definitely pushing that uh, fantasy boundary, and I think that you know it's it's hard to get people to come along with you when you do. And that. it's not a comfortable game. It's not about no. wish fulfillment. No, I mean it takes two GMs. It. It's the two GMs, Brennan. Right, it's not that, the fantasy. That must be it. <laughs> <laughs> Getting two GMs in one room to run the same game. What are you crazy? 
Uh, David, I, I really want to get your take on this. Uh, when are we going to see a completely different take on fantasy? I think that's something you're trying to tackle, right? What, tell us, what's it going to take? Um, well, I um, that's a that's again hard question. I don't really think, and I agree with John. I don't really think that fantasy is a genre per se. Um, it's definitely not a type of story. I'm trying to think of recent fantasy stories that I've enjoyed. Things like uh, Mistborn, um, and they have the same trappings, and it's the same BS that we're used to. It's just a different type of story. Um, I like mysteries. I like heist stories. Um, I don't really do the whole, you know, monomyth um, adventure quest thing. Um, that's not for me. But again, fantasy, being stuck in the trappings has little to nothing to do with the types of stories that we're telling. Um, I just think that it's going to take a couple of things stepping up. Um, I'm kind of surprised that, um, like, for example, Harry Potter, Potter didn't do something bigger with gaming. Um, why it didn't step into that that realm? It could have. It could have been the next thing for us. She won't let it happen. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, <laughs> it's a little disingenuous to say that. I don't know why, but yeah, and that's that's it. That's it. Um, but we could we could see something. I just I don't really think that whether or not it's fantasy matters um, because there are no fantasy stories. There are, there are fantasy trappings wrapped around uh, different types of stories that we're familiar with. Gaming has um, a unique advantage in that it does different stuff beyond just stories. Um, dungeon crawls, I've played old D&D games and stuff like that. Um, I wouldn't really call what was going on in the game mechanics, what the game brought to the table. I wouldn't call that story. That's just, you know, hidden monsters, taking treasure, whatever. Um, the story is stuff that we brought to the table. Um... It seems to me that um, with those type of stories uh, that, that people are telling, it's not something that the games are bringing. It's not something the games are delivering. It's something that they're delivering and something they're identifying with. Um, so next big thing, no, no idea. I don't, I, don't, I don't know when we're going to see something different um, because I don't really see any of it as different. It all looks the same to me. Hmm. Um, James. What's, yes. your, what's your take on what we need to get a fantasy, a new fantasy? Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm kind of uh, on the outside of this. I mean, I don't read a lot of fantasy literature. The stuff that I read is mostly uh, horror stories, which I read as fantasy. I mean, Lovecraft doesn't scare me. I, I read those the way it sounds like other people read fantasy. Oh, cool ideas. Oh, look at that monster. And oh, they're in this place. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I don't see much need for new things. I mean, only in the past year I've gotten into Doctor Who. It's only in the past month I've started watching, you know, the Tom Baker old stuff. You know, that's new to me. Why do I have to worry about what's new for everyone else, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, Robert E. Howard, uh, his original texts have only been published now in the last ten years, right? I mean, before that, it was the, you know, stories that had been altered by other people. Uh, you know, so I'm sure that there are people that are dying for the next new thing, but, you know, I'm happy exploring things that I'd never seen that are old. So, yeah. Uh, Brennan, uh, or Jill, did, did you have anything to add for what we need? Uh, for what we need? Yeah, or what, well, what, really when would we see it? Sorry, I probably read a different version of fantasy that the rest of you read because I read paranormal romance. And I don't expect many of the men sitting here to read that either. <laughs> and it's, I already see lots of new things in the industry because it's new to me. It, like James was saying, like as much as you're all going to hate it, Twilight changed how people looked at vampires. And that was big and that was new. And yeah, they're debatable if they were vampires, but it was still there and it was popular. And... Fifty Shades of Grey changed how you read. It's okay to read those things in public, and it's all fantasy. It doesn't happen, but I just see it as there's no such next big thing because at some point in time, somebody's going to write something, and it'll be on fire, and it doesn't matter because it is the same old stuff. It's just what's popular right now. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, any Anyone else have a, an opinion or should we just go ahead and move to 
Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I'm good. Okay, good. I'm good. Well, uh, we've we've hit our hour, and I really appreciate you guys taking the time uh, to spend an hour with me. John, James, Jill, David, Brennan, thank you, all of you. We will have links uh, at the Indie Plus page to all the stuff that you're working on, the Kickstarter that's coming up for Wicked Fantasy, uh, Machine Age, Lamentations of the Flame Princess, and all of Galileo games and Galileo books. Uh, we'll have that on the Indie Plus page, so please do check it out. Uh, thanks for checking out the uh, Game Night, Pound Game Night, and Indie Plus is Fantasy Dead panel. You guys have a great evening. You go now! <laughs>